Personal Finance PowerPoint Presentation. Corporate Actions. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia. What are corporate actions which you can find online? Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This by Reem Hackle, updated January 19, 2022. In prior presentations, we've been taking a look at investment goals, investment strategies, investment tools, keeping in mind the two primary categories of investments, one being the fixed income, typically bonds, two being the equity, the stocks. Now we're looking at what are corporate actions when a publicly traded company issues a corporate action it is doing something that will affect its stock price which is of course important to us as stockholders if you're a shareholder or considering buying shares of a company you need to understand how an action will affect the company's stock a corporate action can also tell you a great deal about the company's financial health and its short-term future so you also can think about well, why would they be taking these types of actions? What does that mean for the company's health as a whole? So examples, corporate actions include stock splits, dividends, mergers and acquisitions, rights issues and spinoffs. All of these are major decisions that typically need to be approved by the corporate's board of directors and authorized by the shareholders. So remember the structure of owning stocks. We as the stockholders will typically own an equity interest, the capacity in having the capacity to say vote, for example, for the board of directors, individual stockholders typically having you know not much voting power right in a similar kind of way as an individual voting in a republic doesn't have a lot of individual power over the uh, function of the republic however uh, you do have that voting capacity to vote for basically the board of directors the board of directors then acting kind of like agents kind of like politicians in a republic board of directors acting on the owner's behalf in order to hire management upper management typically CEOs and so on and then the CEOs are going to be there hiring the individuals uh, the, and the employees of the corporation so they're going to they're going to be the ones that are going to be making these types of decisions right for things like a stock split a dividend mergers and acquisitions rights and issues and spinoffs so we've got to get our mind in in their head and think about well what are they thinking what does that mean to my investments so the stock split let's take a look at the stock split first here the stock split sometimes called a bonus share divides the value of each of the outstanding shares of a company so a two for one stock split is most common so you've got two for one stock split it is basically what it sounds like an investor who holds one share will ultimately own two shares each worth exactly half the price of the original share and that's what we would expect to be happening on the market, right? Because the stock price you would think would be reflecting the value, the kind of the equity value assets minus liabilities in essence of the company. So if you had one stock and then all of a sudden the corporation is gonna say, I'm gonna take all those stocks and split them. So now you have two stocks. Well, those two stocks you would think now would be worth half as much as they were before leaving you basically in the same position, but now owning uh, the two stocks that are worth half as much. So the company has just cut its own stock price in half. So you can think about why would they do that? You could say, well, they, what have they done? They've, they've put you in the same position generally, but now the stocks themselves are half the price. So why would that be? Well, maybe, maybe they think that it's gonna be better valued for trading, for example, or something like that at a half a price to be more in alignment with the optimal you know, price level of stocks. So the market will adjust the price upwards uh, the day the split is implemented so the effects uh, current shareholders are rewarded and a pent uh, and potential buyers are more interested so notably there are twice as many common shares out there than there were before the split so clearly you have twice as many because they split all the stocks nevertheless a stock split is a non-event because the stock split is a non-event because it does not affect the company's equity or its market capitalization in other words normally if they issue the stock that's one way for them to generate capital they issue the stock in order to get money from people and and that's going to increase the equity assets minus equity in this case you've got twice as much kind of equity or stock out there you got twice as much stock but they didn't issue the stock they just had a stock split so there's no impact say on the cash that is involved or anything like that 
so only the number of shares outstanding changes. The stock split are gratifying for shareholders uh, both immediately and in long term. Even after that initial uh, pop, they often drive the price of stock higher. So you can think, why would they do it? Well, maybe now that they do the stock split, uh, maybe that they have a more optimal kind of price level and maybe that will be helpful in, in driving the price of the stocks higher. Cautious investors may worry that repeated stock splits will result in too many shares being created. So when, when you're thinking about the corporation itself, you, you would think that there's some kind of more optimal levels of how many shares basically should be, should be outstanding and what, you know, what might be the optimal price for uh, maximizing you know, trading potential and the value of the stocks, for example. The reverse split. A reverse split would be implemented by a company that wants to force up the price of its shares. So you could have a situation where the stocks look too low. People are saying, hey, the price is quite low. Maybe, maybe the stock is getting in danger of not even being on the exchange anymore because they're going to go below a certain threshold. So they might say, how can I up the price uh, in the shares. Well, you could do better job in the corporation and people might want to buy it more, or <laughs> you could try to do a reverse split. So, uh, so that, for example, a shareholder who owns 10 shares of stock valued at $1 each will have only one share after a reverse split of 10, after a reverse split of 10 for one, but that one share will be valued at $10. Let's do that one more time. For example, a shareholder who owns 10 shares of stock valued at one dollar each will have only one share after a reverse split of 10 for one so a 10 for one reverse split your 10 shares have now been reduced to one share but instead of that one share being worth one dollar it's now worth ten dollars so you again you're in the same kind of position you were before in in theory even though the the numbers have changed in terms of how many shares you own and then the price of the shares. So a reverse split can be a sign that the company's stock has sunk so low that its executives want to shore up the price or at least make it appear that the stock is stronger. So it's usually not a good sign. So you can see why they would want to do it because they want to bring the stock price up to that sweet zone of where you know stocks they think should be an optimal trading zone. But the act of them doing that usually looks bad on the market. So they could be hit negatively perception wise uh, for that. So the company may even need to avoid getting categorized as a penny stock. So if they go below a certain level, they'll get kicked off the exchange and that wouldn't be good. So in other cases, a company may be using a reverse split to drive out small investors. So what are corporate actions? So we've got the dividends. So a company can issue dividends uh, in either cash or stock. So dividends, typically we think of like cash dividends, but they can give, of course, stock dividends too. Typically they are paid out at specific periods, usually quarterly or annually. Now note, if you're the owner of the corporation, you have stocks, but you don't have enough stocks to really influence the activities of the corporation. Unlike a sole proprietorship or partnership, you can't tell the corporation, hey, you're making money, give me some of that money in the form of a draw, as it would be for a sole proprietorship. The corporation could give you money, right? They might give the, the, the shareholders money, but they would have to decide from the management and the board of directors as to whether they're going to be giving dividends out or not. And part of the reason of that is that the shareholders are all owning equal shares. So the shareholders can't get dividends that are unequal. The, sh the dividends have to be given equally as opposed to a partnership where you, you, know, you might be drawing out different drawings than the other partners and stuff like that, which is more complex. And therefore the dividend amounts of the dividend have to be determined uniformly and then given out uniformly to all the owners or all the stocks. So essentially, these are a share of companies' profits that are being paid to owners of the company, of the stocks, all right? They're earning money. So what do you want to do with that money as the, as the company? If you're the owner of the stock, what do I want the company to do with it? If they were acting in my best interest, either give it to me in the form of a dividend or put it back in the company so that you grow buying more capital and more machinery so that the value of the stock goes up and I could sell it for more. So dividend payments affect the equity of a company. The distributed equity, retained earnings and or paid in capital is reduced. So when you think about the books of the company, assets minus liabilities is the equity in the company. You would think the valuation of the stock would be derived from, at least in large part, the equity in the company. If the company pays out some of the dividends, 
to the owners, they're reducing the equity in the company, the assets minus liabilities, which you would expect reduces the stock price to some degree. But of course, on the other side, you're getting some money from it <laughs> in the form of dividends if you're the stock owner. So a cash dividend is straightforward. Each shareholder is paid a certain amount of money for each share. If an investor owns 100 shares and a cash dividend is uh, 50 cents per share, their owner will get $50. So a cash dividend just says we're going to give out a certain amount of money for each of the shares that are owned. If you own multiple shares, you're going to get some multiple of that amount that we're going to give out. So a stock dividend also comes from distribution, distri <laughs> distributable equity, but in the form of stock instead of cash. So it gets a little bit more complex when you're looking at the stock dividend because they're not going to give you cash. They're giving you stock. So if the stock dividend is 10%, for example, the shareholder will receive one additional share for every 10 owned. So if the company has a million shares outstanding, the stock dividend would increase outstanding shares to a total of 1 million, uh, 1 .1 million. So now you can see that this has an impact on the number of shares that are outstanding in a little bit you know, possibly a little bit different way than like the stock split situation because they're actually giving you you know, new stocks that are being issued out uh, with value instead of basically having a stock split where each stock that you had is now doubled, but you would think in theory worth half as much. So notably, the increase in shares dilutes the earnings per share. So the earnings per share is now less because there's more shares out there, you know, at this point in time. So the earnings per individual. So, so the stock price would decrease. So you would think the stock price would decrease because it's a dividend. And so that would be similar to, you know, a cash dividend as well. So that because you're, the equity is going down as they distribute value, in this case, not in the form of cash, but in the form of stock. The distribution of a, ca of a cash dividend signals an investor that the company has substantial retained earnings from which shareholders can directly benefit. So if they're giving out tax or cash dividends, that's usually a good sign that they're healthy because they can afford to give out cash dividends. Now also just note that gr companies that are growing are less likely to give out a dividend because they're trying to generate capital in order to grow. And that could be good for investors because they might be growing at a higher rate. But if they have the capacity to give out cash dividends, that should signal to the economy or may signal to the economy and the market that they're healthy and they have the capacity to do that which could be a good sign for the stock price. So by using its retained capital or paid in capital account, a company is indicating that it expects to have little trouble replacing those funds in future. So their revenue should be strong, they're thinking. So however, when a growth stock starts to issue uh, dividends, many investors conclude that a company that was rapidly growing is settling down for a stable but unspectacular rate of growth. So if you're investing in a growth stock, you're expecting them to take the money and reinvest it because they're in a growth rate. They're putting that money into more facilities, machinery and equipment in order to grow faster. And that's why you're there. If they start giving dividends out, you're thinking, okay, now they've achieved their growth phase. Maybe they're flattening out at this point in time and don't have the same kind of growth potential. So you might see that as a good sign because they're healthy, they've got money but you might see it as a bad sign in terms of they're not going to be growing at the same rate that they were growing before. And if that's what you're investing in, you might move to another growth stock. So uh, rights issues, a company um, implementing a rights issue is offering additional or new shares only to current shareholders. So the existing shareholders are given the right to purchase or receive these shares before they are offered to the public. So they might give then a rights issue to the existing shareholders note that this gives the existing shareholders the capacity to buy the shares possibly before others because if they were to issue more shares outside it dilutes the the existing shareholders shares right because now if you put more shares out there and the shares represent ownership of the value of the company assets minus liabilities or equity and they just keep on issuing shares well they're diluting the the shares that you have so they might then give you the the opportunity to purchase shares first, right? So that you can you can uh, hold your current position relative to the total shares that are out there, so on. So a rights issue regularly takes place in the form of a stock split 
and in any case can indicate that existing shareholders are being offered a chance to take advantage of a promising new development. Mergers and acquisitions. A merger occurs when two or more companies combine into one with all parties involved agreed to the terms. So now you've got companies basically combining together, merging and acquiring. Notice that these two terms, they sound you know like like you kind of put them together because a lot of a lot of things that are quoted there's a lot of discussion or you can you can dive into the details in terms of well was that an actual merger of two equals coming together or was it really an acquisition right most of these mergers and acquisitions come down to basically a dominant company and a, and another company one swallowing the other one but the the they don't want to call it an acquisition possibly because that would make the that it might be harder for the deal to go through for the company that's being swallowed right on that on that one but in any case you can get into the details of that mergers and acquisitions so usually one company surrenders its stock to the other so when a company undertakes a merger shareholders may welcome it as an expansion so you might say merger acquisition great because now there's going to be growth maybe in that particular area hopefully there's some synergy that happens it's going to increase the stock on the other hand they could uh, conclude that the industry is shrinking forcing the company to gobble up the competition to keep growing so maybe they've got no you might interpret it as to say they've got no more innovative power themselves they're just the only way for them to grow is to is to like conquer other territories like a like a like a like a country that can't doesn't have any innovation but they just are trying to swallow territory to increase the growth or something like that which might not be as healthy so in in an acquisition a company buys a majority stake of a target company's shares the shares are not swapped or merged acquisitions can be friendly or hostile a reverse merger is also possible in this scenario a private company acquires a public company usually one that is not thriving so the private company has just transferred itself into a publicly traded company without going through the tedious process of an initial public offering. It may change its name and issue new shares. So then we have the spinoff. The spinoff occurs when an existing public company sells a part of its shares or distributes new shares in order to create a new independent company. So that you might be saying, there was a trend at, at some point where, where all the companies were becoming these big conglomerate type of companies. And the theory was that size was better, economies of scales was good, and that management, if they were good, they could manage anything because it's all the same. And then later on, it seemed like the theory started to say, hey, look, maybe, it, maybe some people are actually better at managing these particular industries. Maybe there's conglomerates that aren't tied together in any particular way, other than just trying to be big, aren't giving us the economies of scale that we were looking for. And so you get this kind of spin-off environment where you're saying, hey, maybe we should spin off this particular component and, and focus in on it. Uh, of itself but you can also have spin-offs that are there because that component of the company is not doing well and that would be a bad sign for that particular part of the company so often the new shares will be offered through a rights issue to the existing shareholders before they are offered to new investors so again you as the existing shareholder might be saying well that's going to change the value of the company and so they might try to give you the initial capacity to buy the shares if you if if you so choose right a spinoff could indicate a company ready to take on a new challenge or one that uh, is refocusing the activities of the main business so so some classic examples it will you know like edison or something when they're going to say i'm just i'm going to i'm going to refocus all of our energy on the core of the business and stop this uh this conglomeration just for conglomeration's sake uh and sometimes that could be a, a healthy move depending on your perspective